Thank you for that kind introduction and good morning to all of you. Good to be with you. A few faces I recognize and a lot of new faces. I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Um, one of the issues that perhaps confront business leaders more than anything else right now is the issue of corporate velocity. So have a look at what's happened since 2010. Firstly, we see that the time required for a business-to-business -business transaction has increased 22%, requiring consensus from more than five people instead of two in 2010. Delivery of IT projects increased by an average of a month at a cost of $43,000 per project. 60% of employees have to engage with at least 10 colleagues a day to get their work done. Half of that 60% need to engage with more than 20 to get their work done. It takes 50% longer to hire a new employee. And two of the primary reasons, collaboration, and transformation. Our collaboration is a good thing, transformation is a good thing. But there's no such thing as a good thing, because any good thing can be a bad thing, and sometimes bad things can be good things. It depends how they're managed and how they're used. And back in 1996, when South Africa was having to enter a global marketplace for the first time after more than 20 years, nearly 30 years of global sanctions, Nelson Mandela, the new president of South Africa at that time, asked me to look at ways to help companies improve their collaboration in a post-apartheid era, so you can imagine that wasn't a very collaborative environment, to improve collaboration and to transform without reducing corporate velocity. And since that time, we've been doing this work throughout the world um, in, in enabling companies to transform without reducing corporate velocity, enabling companies to develop, to develop high levels of collaboration without necessarily reducing corporate velocity. And we've been doing that by the alignment of strategy, leadership, and culture. So just as an example, it was uh, this weekend at the encouragement of my children and grandchildren, I walked into a jeans store <laughs> to buy the coolest pair of jeans. When I walked in, I was completely overwhelmed by the choice. The only thing that would have been more overwhelming would have been to try to do it online. A salesperson noticed me, came up to me, and asked me about three questions about my lifestyle. He then went to the shelf and pulled out a pair of jeans and says, this is the one for you. I said, well, let me go and try it on. He said, why? This is the one for you. <laughs> I said, size, fit. He said, this is the one for you. You can try it on if you want. I said, fine, I'll go and try it on. Can you give me a few others? He said, why? <laughs> this is the one for you. And he was right. That's distinction. That's a company you go back to. I took all my kids back there and said, got them all jeans. And he treated them all differently. But what do you need to do to have that kind of interface? That store, that company can compete with Amazon. Because you don't get that on Amazon. That company can compete with anybody online. Because you don't get that interface with anybody online. Is that about strategy? Is that about leadership? Or is that about culture? The answer is you're not going to get that level of distinction by improving your leadership or your strategy or your culture. You're only going to get that level of distinction if you're able to integrate strategy, leadership, and culture in a way that truly distinguishes you. And the way we did this is through understanding that transformation, unlike change, is about transforming the operating system itself. 
not just increasing your fund of knowledge or your behavioral repertoire. And too often, leadership development is about increasing a behavioral repertoire or providing an increased fund of knowledge. That's not what brings about transformation. What brings about transformation is changing the operating system itself. Not just the operating system of the organization, yes, you need to do that, but the operating system of everybody who le leads and works in that organization. And perhaps that explains why I, with a background both as a spiritual leader, as a rabbi, and as a businessman in international business for uh, over 30 years, explains my attraction to this area of work, because not only are we talking about business results, we're talking about transforming the way people think, behave, and live. So we're going to spend the few minutes that we have together looking at what transformation is, about transforming culture, transforming leadership, and transforming strategy, and using purpose as a vehicle to align strategy, culture, and leadership, and we'll look at some of, some of the results that purpose-driven alignment has accomplished. Take a few minutes on change versus transformation. Anybody want to give some suggestions? What's the difference between change and transformation? We use the word a lot, transformation. And transformation, as, as Tom Bernard says, is responsible for a lot of the reduction of corporate velocity. So we've got to be careful with the word. What is the difference between change and, and transformation? Great. Transformation is sustainable. Change is temporary. We think it's permanent, but it isn't. So we don't really know whether it was transformation or change until some years later. That's the only time we'll know whether there was transformation. Any other suggestions? Any differences? Yes. I think transformation is more of a change, of a mindset reinvestment, Great. rather Great. than just an action. Change is a set of actions, it's a change of process, it's a change of structure, those are all changes. Transformation is a change of mindset that, that has to take place. Any others? So, it's incremental change, whereas transformation is exponential. It's not really step by step, you've actually got to change exponentially. Change is operational. Transformation is value-based and it's strategic. You can't do transformation if it's delegated to HR or if it's delegated to the COO and to operations. Transformation has to be across the organization. Change can be temporary. When old habits return, transformation is permanent, as we've just said. Change is about behaviors. Transformation is about a way of thinking. Change can be commanded. Transformation must be inspired. So let's have a look at transforming a culture and what that entails. The need for it. The need for it is, as Jeff Colvin said at the end of last year, in 21st century companies, employees own most of the assets because they are most of the assets. I still hear leaders of organizations saying people are our most valuable resources. Have you heard that? That is so 1900s. <laughs> people are our most valuable resource. They're not a resource. They're not even an asset in terms of being a, a valuable asset. They are the assets. So for the first time in history, shareholders do not own the assets of an organization. And the managers who represent those shareholders have little control over the assets of the organization. That's the big shift that has taken place. That the people, the body, the stakeholders that used to own the assets don't own the assets anymore because the assets are people. And they own their own assets. They are the assets. Klaus Schwab said at the last um, World Economic Forum, Sometimes I wonder whether the inexorable integration of technology in our lives could diminish some of our quintessential human capacities, such as compassion and cooperation. In the end, it all comes down to people and values. 
Now those two words, compassion and cooperation, at the same World Economic Forum, there was a widespread acceptance of the fact that, co that compassion and cooperation are the two most important factors for sustainable innovation. And what is there more important for transformation than the capacity to innovate? But to innovate, you need compassion. You need to be able to empathize with the needs of others. That's how you innovate. You're able to sense and be aware and intuit the needs of customers and the needs of others. And the ability to collaborate and cooperate. And Klaus Schwab says, are we perhaps losing those quintessential capacities that are so, so fundamental and so important. And so we've got to look at companies that are becoming more and more technology driven and understand the need to be able to re-infuse compassion and cooperation. And if I were to say to you, just based on the little bit we've talked about in the last 10 minutes or less, what is the danger in increasing levels of compassion and cooperation? What would you say? This is a downside to everything. Anyone want to suggest? What is the downside to increasing cooperation and compassion? Slow down, corporate. Slow down corporate velocity, and your competitors are faster and more nimble and agile than you. And that's the real issue. How do you do this without slowing corporate velocity? It's easy to do it, relatively easy to do it. That's not the challenge. The challenge is how do you do this? How do you increase compassion and cooperation? without slowing down corporate velocity. So have a look and see at some of the findings from this year's CEO survey by PwC. It's so interesting, if you were to ask yourself in your organization, what does management spend its time measuring? I think you'll find they measure history. Am I right? You measure last week's, last year's results, last month's results, you measure budgets, targets, you're measuring history. How much in a fast-moving economy does history have to do with future performance? Think back to the, some of the big ones, but they're more recent ones too. What was in Enron's history like weeks before it collapsed? Pretty good. And so many other companies that disappeared overnight. History was fine. So we're busy looking in the rear view mirror while the collision is in front of us. And CEOs are saying what we ought to be looking at. If we want to get a measure of the future is key risks. Risk will tell you about the future. And innovation, how innovative. And for innovation we're going to need compassion and collaboration. So that becomes a strategic necessity. Just as you need other economic inputs, you need capital, you need raw materials, you need people, so do you need compassion and innovation if you're going to deliver results. But what these CEOs say is that's about measuring, but that's not what the conversation should be about. The conversation should be about values and purpose and about strategic thinking. That's what we ought to talk about in our meetings. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, just ask yourselves, what are your meetings about? What do you talk about? What are you measuring and what are you talking about? And you'll realize the risks. Our eyes are off the ball. Our eyes are on the wrong metrics and the conversations are not the right conversations. But to change that, you can't just change the agenda of meetings. You're changing a mindset. You're changing an operating system. And isn't that what transformation is all about? Transformation is to transform from measuring the past to measuring the future, and from talking about operational issues to talk about values and purpose and strategic thinking. That's transformation. Really interesting that today 85% of customers are concerned with cost and convenience, but CEOs believe that by 2020, only 58% will be concerned about cost and convenience. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not because cost and convenience will cease to be important. It's just that the internet will have equalized. Through, through aggregating websites, convenience and price will be equalized. Everybody will be charging the same for everything. 
that's not going to be what distinguishes anybody. So distinction becomes a completely different challenge. What customers seek is relationships to organizations that address wider stakeholder needs. That goes up to 41%. That becomes a distinguishing factor. What is the soul of your organization? What is the belief system of your organization? What are the values that your organization truly lives by? Not the values that are stated on a sheet of values. Enron had great values. It's not about the values on your, on your value statement. It's about the way your organization governs itself and manages itself and leads itself. That's what people are going to be a lot more interested in. And that sense of purpose is something that employees want the most at that same Future of Work Forum in New York last year. Having purpose at work is one of the things that employees want the most. And we see that again in the PwC survey. That whereas today 57% want to be with companies whose values are aligned with their own, that goes up to 63% in 2020, but it's already at 57%. Whereas people, this is now talking about new hires, that look at competitive compensation as the important factor is only 39% today. So 39%, substantially less than half, make their decisions on the basis of compensation. And another little secret, which I'm sure you'll know intuitively, is those 39% are not the people you want to hire in any case. You want to hire the other 59%, 51%. Those are the people that you really want to hire. But by 2020, it will only be 34% that even care about that. Again, the internet and the diffusion of information is going to make payment kind of the same. You're going to have to offer certain basics, otherwise you're not going to get talent. That's not going to be the differentiator. What people, 63%, and those are the 63% that you do want, want some sense of values alignment. I'm interested for you to consider for a moment how many of your recruiting methods and tests check for values alignment in a deep way. And do we have even the tools to be able to do that? Julia Wagner from SAP Success Factors, is she here? Hi, Julia. Is going to talk a little later. She was going to talk before me, so I thought I could quote from her speech. Well, I'm quoting from her speech from without... <laughs> but, but, but in her abstract, she mentioned the talent is looking for a more human work environment, where joy in work is not only possible, but expected. And she asks the important question, how will old world companies be able to provide this and satisfy this need? Links right into the study we've just looked at from PwC. It's not about compensation anymore. You have to be market related for compensation, but that's not what's going to drive the final choice. There are other things that are going to drive the final choice, and, and you, you'll hear, you hear I'm, I'm sure, some, some fascinating things from her a little later today, but there are things around the work environment, its humanity, and the opportunity to find joy in that work. But there's another question to ask around this again, and you know the question already. How do you provide a more human culture with greater joy in work without slowing corporate velocity? That becomes the real issue. It's interesting, absenteeism costs our economy a fortune. Somewhere around $30 billion. But presenteeism, which is defined as those people who come to work but leave themselves at home, <laughs> is costing up, and that's serious because they're a cost. You've got to pay for them still. Yeah. They're not doing much, but you've still got to pay for them. That's costing us 200 billion, much more serious. And we're worried about absenteeism. Absenteeism isn't the real problem. Unfortunately, most employees, when they're absent, are more productive than when they're there. Because when they're there, they pull everybody else down too. So you're actually better off with those people being absent. The ones who are frequently absent, and I'm not talking about legitimate issues, 
But those who are frequently absent are often frequently absent because they're unengaged and uninterested and uninspired and will find whatever excuse they can to be absent. Those are the people you don't want to be present because when they're present, they cost you more than when they're absent. So we should be focusing on presenteeism much more so than on absenteeism. And the way you make sure that you can provide an environment where there is joy and there is a human environment is by focusing on purpose. Where you'll find that some 40% of purposeful employees are more focused, 65 more energized, and so on. All these wonderful statistics of what it is to have an employee who feels an alignment between their own life's purpose and the purpose of, of their work. And that's what transforming culture is about. You can't transform culture without getting into the value systems of the people who create that culture. What is it that drives them? What is the purpose in their lives? And in our leadership work, that's where we start. We don't start with a company's purpose. We start with your purpose, each individual. What do you put in this world to do? And are you in the right company doing the right work to give expression to that purpose? Because if you are, then you're not one of those people whose presenteeism costs the companies the billions that others, that others do. Let's move into transforming leadership. So the same Klaus Schwab mentioned at the same World Economic Forum, that we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to each other in its scale, scope, and complexity. The transformation will be unlike anything humankind has ever experienced before. And I'd like to point out he wasn't saying this in 1999 or 2005. He's saying this now. What we've seen in technology is nothing like what's about to happen. And how ready are we for that? These are the different industrial revolutions. They used to be a hundred years apart from one another, now they're happening a little faster. But what's really interesting are the leadership capacities that he identified that was widely accepted at the, at the World Economic Forum the three leadership capacities that are most important to cultivate. That leaders should understand the speed and unpredictability of their changing environment. That's a big one. The unpredictability. People understand things are changing. But they're changing in ways that cannot be predicted. The ability to challenge the assumptions of operating teams and to relentlessly and continuously innovate. And the problem is that leaders, when we ask leaders what it is, what capacities they believe they most need to develop, they come up with the blue bars, technology, finance, innovation, strategy. But when we ask their reports what they believe leaders need to take additional training in, it's around leadership and emotional intelligence. How often is it, we know from our own experience, that the C-suite will hire consultants and trainers to develop leadership capacities for them. Very seldom for us. And yet that's the capacity that their reports believe is most lacking. And the challenge with that is that that C-suite and the people immediately below them don't have time for leadership development. And leadership development in isolation doesn't seem to be that much of a priority. The reason being because it isn't tied to strategy. And that becomes key to perhaps the success that we've had around the world in developing leaders is because at a senior level, we're able to integrate the organization strategy with the leadership development. Leadership development needs to be customized. It needs to be customized to the strategy of the organization, and the strategy of the organization needs to be aligned with the culture of the organization. And what is it so much in, in strategy that is so important? So I'll just run you through this uh, rather quickly because this is the essence of distinction. The speed with which a differentiated offering becomes commoditized has become virtually instant. There is no time to recover ROI unless you have really powerful patents. And this has led 
Matthew Stewart and, and Rita Gunter McGrath and others to claim the idea of competitive advantage doesn't exist anymore. Companies don't have competitive advantages anymore. Which leads us to the idea of distinction as a substitute for what used to be competitive advantage. And very briefly, distinction is defined as something that is recognizably different in nature from something else of a similar type. And the key word here is different in nature. It's not about acquiring competitive advantage. That used to be the way to go. How do we set up competitive advantages? How do we set up core competencies? How do we find our niche? These were all things we could do artificially and then build up barriers to, to entry around those competitive advantages. But what we're looking at here, and this is the work that we do with our clients, is how do you find what's recognizably different in your nature, not something you've acquired because your competitors can acquire it too. How do you find something that is as different in your nature as the difference between the stripes and the spots of a leopard and, and a tiger? Those aren't competitive advantages, that's distinction. If it was a competitive advantage, a leopard could hire McKinsey's and could become a tiger. But they can't do that because this isn't about competitive advantage. This is about distinction. It's about who we are at our essence. And Herb Keller has said in the beginning of founding Southwest Airlines and lived by that, we're interested in intangibles, a spiritual infusion, because they're the hardest things for competitors to replicate. The tangible things your competitors can go out and buy, but they can't buy your spirit. So it's the most powerful thing of all. He understood it wasn't about competitive advantage. It was about distinction. And with that philosophy, he was able to deliver growth in, in his organization year on year since its founding until the current day, through the fuel crisis, through the wars, through the recessions, Southwest Airlines, following this principle, has been able to deliver growth. Distinction comes about through the unique way a company thinks about its strategy, the behavior of its leaders, and the culture that results. It's not in one of those three areas. It's in the integration of all three areas. And so if you look at distinction, really, we're saying that a purpose-driven strategy and a purpose-centered culture is what delivers distinction. Distinction is the outcome of an aligned strategy, culture, and leadership philosophy that has purpose as its center. There's nothing mushy about purpose. It's pure strategy. So let's just have a look briefly at using purpose to align strategy, culture, and leadership. What is purpose? And what do we mean by it? So if you look at that guy, he's a knight on a horse, ready to slaughter the, jag the dragon. That's what he's got to do. Not very motivated, not very inspired. That changes substantially when we give him a reason for doing it. So now we move into a higher purpose. This is about saving the damsel. It's not about necessarily killing the dragon. And he might well find more creative ways to do this. He might find that he can save the damsel without killing the dragon. Uh, and so the ability to innovate results from clearly articulated purpose. And even this guy here, whose job might be to milk the cow, in which case he's doing really well, but if his job was to supply milk to the community, he wouldn't be doing so well. And he would know that to extend his job beyond job description. So one of the things we have to get moved beyond is the old 1900s ideas of job descriptions and move into purpose-driven positions. What am I doing to further the purpose of the organization becomes really crucial. And purpose answers every area. It's the why question, the answer to the why question that has to answer why the structure, why these operations, why this financial strategy, why this technology project, why these people strategies. There's got to be one answer to all of those questions. And the answer has to be the organization's purpose. And when you look at some of the results of purpose-driven com companies, it's quite phenomenal. Because you'll find that if $100 were invested in good to great companies, they would have yielded $178 in the period 96 to 2011. We've got the more up-to-date numbers, and they're, they're much the same. If you would have invested $100 in an S&P 500 portfolio of companies, you would have got $157 back. But if you would have invested $100 in purpose-driven companies, you would have got $1,646 back. It's a total no-brainer if you do it right. 
if, it's a, if there's full alignment of strategy, leadership, and culture, those are the kind of results that we get as a result. And we see that happening in various different uh, organizations that we've worked with, um, that others have worked with. These are three well-known icons um, who've all, at some point, aligned purpose, strategy, and culture. And these are the kind of results that they got. Uh, here you see Lego uh, and what they were able to achieve. Apple when Steve Jobs gave it purpose. And, um, and Starbucks when Howard Schultz came back and gave Starbucks its purpose. So when you align, purpose is the foundation of all. You start with purpose. That has to be very clearly defined and articulated because that in itself inspires people. And strategy is an emergent outcome from an inspired group of people who know their purpose and the result of that is activation rather than the other way around. And so in conclusion, I want to leave you with five questions that you should be asking and your organization should be asking. These are just five questions to help you lead the conversation to alignment of strategy, leadership, and culture, lead the conversation to definition of purpose, and lead the conversation to distinction, rather than talking about history and, and, and operations. Firstly, has my company articulated the higher and somewhat unique purpose of its existence? And does everybody in the corporation know it? Is our culture aligned to this unique difference that we make? It's all very well, we've got a statement. How is our culture aligned? What is unique about our culture that is designed, architected in a way, to deliver on that purpose? Are our leadership behaviors aligned to it? Now you better look upwards, you better look at the top team. Are their behaviors aligned to the purpose of this organization? Do we have the talent we need to deliver on our purpose and build our culture? And lastly, perhaps most important, are we structured to unlock our talent's potential? Most of our structures are designed to lock up our, potential, our talent's potential, to burden it with bureaucracy and systems and processes which slow corporate velocity. Is our structure designed to unlock human energy or to limit human energy? Those are the five questions that management discussions and conversations should revolve around. That's Galileo's telescope. When he took his friends out onto his balcony just after discovering, inventing his telescope, and he showed them the craters on the moons and the, on the moon and the rings around Saturn, he wasn't showing them anything they hadn't seen before that didn't exist before. He was simply showing them things they hadn't seen before because they didn't have the lenses with which to see it. And to me, that's perhaps the most important function of the CHRO. Not to create anything that wasn't there before, not to discover anything that wasn't there before, but to give management and leadership the lenses through which to see their people, their organizations, their strategies, their leadership philosophy, and their cultures in ways they've never seen before. Because as you know from Marcel Proust, the real voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And I hope in this short time we've had together, I've perhaps helped you look at your world through a slightly different lens and have new eyes on the opportunities to distinguish your organizations during this fourth industrial revolution in this environment where change is not only fast but unpredictable, in this environment where people aren't your most important assets, they are your only assets, to understand some of the changes that need to come about in the way we lead and manage them. So thank you for your attention and look forward to hearing great things.